on numerical methods in civil engineering. We will continue with our discussion on conjugate gradient methods. Last time we looked at the method of conjugate directions and at the end of the lecture we said that the conjugate gradient method is just a specialization of the method of conjugate directions. So, what was the method of conjugate directions? Well, the, why do we need conjugate directions? Well, we, we, we started with the postulate that the efficiency of any gradient based method improves significantly if we do not need to retrace our steps in the solution space, right. That, that was not in, that was not a feature of the steepest gradient method, that is the steepest descent method. That is why we found that we often had to retrace our steps. But the advantage of the method of conjugate directions was that the steps we took, we do not have to take those steps again. We never retrace our steps. The steps we take are unique and we take them once only. The conjugate di direction method ensures this because the search directions are mutually independent and constitute a basis for the n dimensional solution space. Indeed, we found that the search directions are a orthogonal to each other where A is some sort of metric in that solution space, right, a measure of distance in the solution space which, which with, with which we define the inner product in the solution space and therefore, the norm in the solution space. So, these, these search directions are A orthogonal to each other which ensures that the function is minimized along each search direction. So, we found that so long as, as soon as we ensure A orthogonality then that automatically ensures that the function is minimized along the search directions. And we further found that when we take subsequent steps, subsequent search directions, subsequent iterations, the error in, the, in a previously traversed search direction never increases, right. So, we systematically keep on reducing the error in each of those search directions, right, and they never, they never recur again. And because of this, we had, we found that in the that the conjugate gradient method, it's a conjugate directions method, is assured to converge in n iterations. Right? It is sure to converge in n iterations. But that is true in the ideal case. In the real world, nothing is as we plan because uh, because of accumulation of round off errors, things like that. The conjugate directions will no, no, no longer be exactly satisfy the orthogonality condition, right. Because of that convergence will be somewhat lesser, the convergence rate will be somewhat lesser, right. We will talk about those things specifically in the context of the conjugate gradient method. The method of conjugate gradients is nothing but the method of conjugate directions where the search directions are constructed by conjugation of the residuals by setting u i is equal to r i. First, let us take a step back. So, what, do, when we discuss the conjugate directions method, I pointed out that a major disadvantage of the conjugate directions method is that at each step, at each iteration, I need all the previous directions. I all need all, if at the iteration i, I need all the directions from 0 to i minus 1 in order to find my, in order to do my Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, right. And because of that, we have to store all those directions, we have to carry all those directions around and at each iteration, we have to take the projection along those directions. So, it is, it is, it for a large problem, the computational cost is enormous, right. And for the conjugate gradient method, we said its great advantage would be that we do not need to carry the old directions around. Why is that? So, we will see why is that, right. So, the one, the first step, the key step in achieving that is to make sure that we choose our search directions from the residual. Remember earlier in the conjugate direction method, we had this set of vectors u i, which formed a linearly independent set in my n dimensional space, right. And then I used to compute my conjugate directions from those set of vectors u i, but at each step doing Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization projecting out the part which is parallel to or which has got, which has got any components along the previous directions, retaining only the part which is orthogonal to the previous directions, right. That is what we did 
for the conjugate gradient uh, for the conjugate directions method. Now, the starting point of the conjugate gradient method is saying that well that set u i is not just any arbitrary set of vectors in my n dimensional space, any arbitrary, arbitrary set of linearly independent vectors in my n dimensional space, they are a specific set of vectors and what are those specific set of vectors? They are my residuals, right. So, the residuals I am going to choose my conjugate directions from my residual vectors, right. Why do we do that? Well, the advantage is that residuals have the property that they are orthogonal to the previous search directions. We obtained that at the end of our last lecture, we obtained this result that each residual at step at, at, at iteration step i is orthogonal to all the previous search directions 0, 1, 2, 3 up to i minus 1, right. So, since the residuals have the property that they are orthogonal to the previous search directions, construction of the search directions from the residual is guaranteed to ensure that the new search direction is orthogonal is linearly is a linearly independent search direction. It is a new linearly independent search direction, right. So, because these residuals have this wonderful property that they are orthogonal to all the previous search directions. So, if I construct my new search direction at step i from my residual, it becomes a lot simpler, right, because, because of that orthogonality property. When will this process break down? Well, when the residual becomes 0. Suppose, during my iteration, my residual becomes 0, then I cannot construct my new search direction from the residual, but then that is not a problem. Why? Because the residual is 0, that means my iteration has converged, right? I have reached the true solution. So, I do not need the residual anymore, I do not need any more search directions, right? So, since the search directions are constructed from the residuals, the subspace spanned by R0, R1 through R minus 1 is identical to the subspace spanned by D0, D1 through D mi D i minus 1, right? because each of those search directions are constructed from the residuals. So, whatever be the space spanned by the residuals, right, that is the same as the subspace as the space spanned by the search directions, right. Recall that we showed earlier that the residual r i is orthogonal to all previous search directions d j, that is r i transpose d j equal to 0 for all i greater than j, right, for all j less than i, right. Hence, r i transpose r j is equal to 0 for all i greater than j. Why? Because r i is, is, is orthogonal to all the d j's right? and the space spanned by the d j's is equal to the space spanned by the r's, right? the previous r's right? r, r 0 through r i minus 1. Right? So, that means each of those residuals must be orthogonal to the previous residuals. Right? So, each of those ortho residuals are orthogonal to the r for the previous residuals. Indeed, r i transpose r j is equal to 0 for all i not equal to j, because the subsequent residuals are also going to be orthogonal to the current residuals. So, basically all the r residuals are going to be orthogonal, right. Subsequent residuals also have to be normal to the space spanned by the previous search vectors, meaning the previous residuals, right. So, r i transpose r j equal to 0 for all i not equal to j. Let us recall that r i is equal to minus a e i. So, we obtained that result earlier, right. So, that means r i is equal to minus a x i the, the iterate value minus the true solution x, which is equal to minus a x i minus 1 plus alpha minus 1 d, d i minus, we have just used the update formula for my x minus x, right. And then I put x i minus 1 and x together that gives me e i minus 1. So, I have minus a e i minus 1 plus alpha minus 1 a d i minus 1 and again a e i minus 1 is nothing but minus a e i minus 1 is nothing but r i minus 1. So, I have r i minus 1 plus alpha minus 1 a d i minus 1. So, what does that tell us? That tells us that each residual is a linear combination of the previous residual and a d i minus 1. So, each residual is a linear combination of the previous residual and the vector which I get by 
taking the product of A and the previous search direction d i minus 1. Now, since both r i minus 1 and d i minus 1 belong to subspace d i, recall what is the subspace d i? The subspace d i consists of all the search directions d 0, d 1, d 2, d 3 up to d i minus 1, right? Up to d i minus 1. And since we know that r i minus 1 and d i minus 1 r's and d's belong to the same subspace, right? So, both r i minus 1 and d i minus 1 belong to the subspace d i, right? The subspace d i plus 1 is obtained by combining the spaces d i and a d i. Why? Just look at this equation, right? r i is equal to r i minus 1, which we know belongs to the subspace d i plus a times d i minus 1. So, it is a d i minus 1 again belongs to the space d i. So, if I have the space d i and I operate on that space with the a, 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 a matrix, right? then I get another space a d i and I put those two spaces together, I get my new space d i plus 1 to which my r i as well as my d i are going to belong. right? So, hence by recursion d i is the subspace spanned by the, so I go on doing this, right. So, d i d 1 is nothing but d 0 plus a d 0, right. d 1 is equal to d 0 plus a d 0. Similarly, we do, we continue doing that. So, eventually we can see that any space d i is spanned by the basis d 0, a d 0, a square d 0, a minus 1 d 0, because every time we operate with a on d on the previous d i on d i minus 1, we get d i, right. So, we continue this and by recursion, we can see d i, we can write it as like this as spanned by these vectors, right. Or equivalently, the subspace with basis r 0, a r 0, a square r 0 and so on, because these are the same subspaces. So, these subspaces which are created by repeatedly applying a matrix to a vector are known as Krilov subspaces. So, I start with a single vector and I operate on that vector with a matrix and then I operate again with that same matrix and keep on doing it, right. And I am assured that those, those, those vectors that I form that I get by operating each time are linearly independent, they are a basis, right. So, that sort of subspace is known as a Prilov subspace, right. Since r i plus 1, now, so that, that, that is that is just a matter of terminology, let us take a step back. Since r i plus 1 is orthogonal to r i, which we know, right, from our little result out here, right, from our little result out here, r i plus 1 is equal to, sorry, r i plus 1 is orthogonal to r i, that means r i plus 1 must be orthogonal to d i plus 1. Why? d i plus 1 has what are the, what are the vectors which, for which are the basis of d i plus 1? r 0, r 1 through r, min, r i minus 1, right? So, to, through, r, through r i, right? d i plus 1 through r i, right? So, since r i plus 1 is orthogonal to r i, so r i plus 1 must be orthogonal to d i plus 1, right? But, a d i is included in d i plus 1, we just found that, right, because d i plus 1 is nothing but, right. So, so hence a r i plus 1 must be orthogonal to a d i, right. Since r i plus 1 is orthogonal to d i plus 1, d i plus 1 is included, a d i is included in d i plus 1, right. Hence r i plus 1 must be orthogonal to a d i. What this makes finding a new search direction d i plus 1 from my new search direction d i plus 1 from the residual at the i plus 1 at step r i plus 1 very easy. Why? Because r i plus 1 by definition it is orthogonal to a d i, right? And hence a orthogonal to all the d i, right? What does d i, d i consist of? d i is spanned by these vectors, right? d 0, d 1, d i minus 1. So, r i plus 1 is orthogonal to a d i, that means it is a orthogonal to all these previous vectors d i minus 1, right. So, that is that is the key idea, right. It is because it is a orthogonal to all those d i minus 1 vectors, by, by, by construction, 
I do not have to carry all those d 0, d 1, d i minus 1 vectors along right. This is automatically my new residual is automatically orthogonal to all those previous vectors right. So, all I need to do is to ensure orthogonality of r i plus 1 with my with d i right with r i plus 1 with d i right. So, so thus the Gram Schmidt procedure need only ensure a orthogonality with d i right. R i plus 1 has to be orthogonal to all the previous search directions. It is, or, it is orthogonal, it is orthogonal to all the previous search directions d 0, d 1 through d i minus 1. So, the only thing that, that will make r i plus 1 d i plus 1 is to ensure that r i plus 1 is orthogonal to d i right then I will get r i plus 1 it becomes d i plus 1 right. So, the gram schmidt orthogonalization becomes a lot simpler. So, only one of the gram schmidt coefficients which normally are given by this right i can be anything j varies from 0 to i minus 1 by definition need to be evaluated. We can see we can get a further um, verification we can verify this further by taking the dot product of this expression right r j plus 1 equal to r j minus alpha j a d j which we just obtained last here right did we just obtained here. So, we take this expression right and take the dot product of this expression with r i right. So, what do I get? I get r i transpose r j plus 1 is equal to r i transpose r j minus alpha j r i transpose a d j. So, this gives me r i transpose a d j equal to this minus this divided by alpha right. Now, we know that this part when i equal to j right this term is going to survive this term is going to survive this term is going to be 0 because i is this is i j plus 1 right. So, this term is going to go to 0 in that case r i transpose a d j will be given by 1 by alpha i r i transpose r i. On the other hand when i equal to j plus 1 then this term is going to go to 0 right and this term is going to survive and this term is going to be equal to minus 1 by alpha i minus 1 r i transpose r i right. In all other cases this term is going to be 0 right because if if i if j plus 1 is not equal to i or j is not equal to i then neither of these terms are going to survive because of the orthogonality of my residuals right. So, in the other cases this term is going to be 0 right. So, what do I get? I get that beta i j is equal to and we are not interested in beta i i right we are only interested in beta i j where j is less than i right where j is goes from 0 to i minus 1 right. So, we are not interested in this term right we are not interested in the first expression we are only interested in the second expression right and because when we substitute that second expression out here right for r i transpose a d j then I get beta i j is equal to 1 by alpha minus 1 r i transpose r i divided by d i transpose a d i minus 1 and this is equal this is going to be true when j is equal to i minus 1 and is going to be 0 for all other j's right. So, like we will we'll like to simplify a little bit further because by recalling that alpha i minus 1 is equal to this which we obtained earlier right substituting this expression for alpha my i minus 1 out here right out here we get beta i i minus 1 is given by this right. But we also obtained earlier d i minus 1 transpose r i minus 1 equal to r i minus 1 transpose r i minus 1 hence we can get beta i i minus 1 in this simple form right. So, that is the only gram schmidt coefficient which is going to be non-zero and it is given by the, re, the by the residual and the previous residual right. Since only beta i i minus 1 is required 
it is no longer necessary to store the old search vectors in order to ensure conjugacy of the search directions. This not only reduces storage, but also drastically curtails the number of computations necessary to calculate the new search direction. Right? So, the final form of the conjugate gradient algorithm is as follows. So, we have summarized it here. So, we start with a certain initial search direction and what is my initial search direction? It is my initial residual and what is my initial residual? That is B minus A x 0. Right? Then I compute my step size. For instance, for 0 I compute alpha 0 equal to minus R 0 transpose R 0 d 0 transpose A d 0 all quantities I know right on the left hand side all the quantities are on the right hand side I know all the quantities right. So, I know my alpha 0 then I compute my x 1 x 1 is equal to x 0 plus alpha 0 d 0 right and once as soon as I compute my x 1 I can compute my new residual right because my new residual is nothing but a times x i plus 1 minus b which I can simplify and write it like that R R 1 I can write as R 0 minus alpha 0 A D 0. Right? So, I compute my new residual I find out my new gram schmidt coefficient using this expression right? R 1 transpose R 1 divided by R 1 transpose uh, sorry R 0 transpose R 0 right? that gives me my new gram schmidt coefficient beta 1 0. Right? beta beta 1 0, then I will compute d 1. How will I compute d 1? Well, I compute it from r 1 plus beta 1 0 d 0 right? and continue like this. Let us, so now let us look at convergence of the conjugate gradient algorithm. We know that by construction for the n-dimensional problem, the conjugate gradient algorithm is bound to converge in n iterations, right? Because that is an n-dimensional space. I am traversing in each time in an independent direction, and by the time I end up, I have spanned the entire space. So I must, and every time I go along a direction, I make sure that the error in that direction is goes to zero, right? So I systematically chop off my errors, right? So the end of n iterations. I am bound to get 0 error normally. However, floating point errors accumulate with number of iterations causing the residuals to lose orthogonality and hence the search directions to lose a orthogonality. Right? Residuals lose orthogonality, search directions since the search directions, are, search directions are obtained from the residuals, the residuals also the search directions also lose a orthogonality. So, hence so, that is why it is important to improve convergence. So, one might say why do you need to study convergence of the CG algorithm? We know that it is sure to converge, but if you converge in fewer number of iterations, right? instead of taking the full n iterations, which is of course, I will talk about that. Later. So, by reducing the number of iterations, you can reduce the accumulation of round off error and the less round off error, the better is the performance of the algorithm. because we are assured of orthogonality of the residuals and residuals will be more orthogonal, less round off, more orthogonal, the search directions will be more a conjugate, right. So, the performance is going to be better, right. So, that is why it is important to study the convergence of the conjugate gradient algorithm. Another point is that the conjugate gradient method is typically used for very large problems with very large ends, right, where my where my direct solution techniques Gauss elimination and variance of that are going to not going to give are going to be ex extremely expensive right so if i have a 100000 by 100000 dimension matrix that i want to solve then that means that yeah i know that it's going to converge in 100000 iterations and that also if there are no round off errors but why go for 100 th that also is very expensive right so wish we wish to cut down that expense also. You do not want to take 100,000 iterations, we want to converge in a fraction of those iterations right? and let us see how we can do that if it is at all possible. right? 
We saw earlier that at each step of the algorithm, the error E i is a linear combination of my original error E 0 and D 0 through D i minus 1. We saw that last class, right? We, may, we spent some time in obtaining that expression, but at any iteration E i, at any iteration i, I can write the error E i as the error initial error plus a linear combination of my search directions up to that point, right? So, E i and the subspace d i, why? Because subspace d i spans all those directions d 0 through d i minus 1, but d i is equal to is, 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 this, is the space spanned by the vectors r 0 a r 0 through a i minus 1 r 0. I just showed that little time little while ago, right? And it is also the space spanned by this, why? Because r 0 is equal to a times e 0, right? Residual is equal to a times the error we know that already, right. So, this is this also d i is the space spanned by a 0 a square e 0 a cube a 0 through a i e 0, right. You can see there is an additional a here, right. So, that is the space spanned by these vectors. Because of this, I can write e i as a combination as, as a combination of these these vectors a, 0, a e 0 a square e 0 and so on and a i by a i e 0, right. So, it is a polynomial in the matrix A, right. So, E i is equal to P i A operating on E 0. So, where P i A is a polynomial in A because you see all these A powers of A appearing here, right. So, it is a polynomial in A operating on E 0 which satisfies the condition P 0 A equal to 1. I is the iteration number here, right. I is the iteration number in the initial iteration, I mean at the 0th iteration p 0 a has got to be equal to 1, otherwise I, this identity is not going to be satisfied, right. And the coefficients of p i a depend on the values of my conjugate gradient coefficients, basically my step size and my Gram-Schmidt coefficients, right. So, expressing E 0 as a linear combination, we can also write E 0 as a linear combination of the ortho n orthonormal eigenvectors of A, right. We, we did that earlier, right. A is a symmetric matrix, its eigenvectors form an orthonormal basis. So, I can always write the error E 0 as a linear combination of my eigenvectors of A, right. So, A E 0 I can write as sigma j equal to 1 to n psi j e j v j right, where v j are the orthonormal eigenvectors of A. Therefore, we can write E i as E i is equal to P i A E 0, which we just saw, right, which is equal to replacing E 0 by sigma xi j v j. I can write it like that, right. And then I have this polynomial in A operating on v j, right. Remember, what is P i A? it is a polynomial in A. So, it has got multiples of A, right, A square, A cube, A, A 4, A n, so on, on A i, right, up to A i, right. So, each of those A's operating on V j is going to give me lambda j V j, the corresponding eigenvalue, because V j is an eigenvector. And if I have A cube operating on V j, what am I going to get? I am going to get lambda j cube operating on V j, right. A j A cube operating on V j is equal to A square operating on lambda j V j is equal to A operating on lambda square V j is equal to lambda cube V j, right. So, this polynomial in A becomes quickly a polynomial, the same polynomial in my eigenvalues lambda, right. So, from a matrix, a polynomial in the matrix A, this becomes a polynomial in my eigenvalues, right. So, this is true, right. So, let us see what A e i becomes. A e i becomes psi j p i lambda j operating on A v j. So, I get lambda j v j, right. A e i is equal to this. So, because just A j operating on v j that gives me another lambda j, right, lambda j v j. And therefore, the norm of e i, by norm I mean e i transpose A e i, right, because whenever I compute norm, I do it with respect to that metric, right, that metric is given by A, right. So, norm of E i square is given by sigma i equal to 1 xi j square 
p i lambda j square lambda j right. So, basically it just take the dot product of this with this right of this vector with this vector and we are going to get this vector this I mean sorry this expression by right? this scalar right dot product of vector has to be a scalar. So, so this is this is my error expression for the conjugate gradient method. It says that at any step at any step in my iteration the error the norm of the error right squared is given by this expression right some coefficients right some coefficients of my initial error basically if I take my initial error project it along my uh, eigenvectors of A right I will get my xi j's right I get my xi j's. So, that is sigma xi j square p i lambda j square lambda j. So, the purpose of the conjugate gradient method is to find that polynomial find that polynomial which minimizes this error right because this is my error. So, the when we minim when we find when we solve the when we are finding the polynomial which minimizes that error right. So, so the way to do that is we calculate let us see. So, we have this expression p i lambda j square j is equal to 1 to n where n are the eigenvalues right. So, this is the sum over all the eigenvalues of a right. So, now I say that if this is equal to this if I pull this thing this polynomial square out of this summation, but make sure that I evaluate it at the eigenvalue which gives the largest value of the polynomial. So, I, mean, I evaluate this polynomial at all the eigenvalues right and then I find out the eigenvalue for which this polynomial is largest right. So, if I pull this expression this expression out of the summation then I am guaranteed that this has got to be less than that right. So, this is what I am doing here I am pulling out that p i lambda j square out of the summation I mean, and I am evaluating it at the value at the Eigen value which maximizes the value of the polynomial right. And if I do that this equality sign changes to that to a lesser than or equal to sign right is that clear because this is a bound right I am taking the largest possible value of the polynomial and I am choosing the Eigen value which maximizes the value of the polynomial right and then this becomes like this I get a bound on the error right. So, that is what we are interested in getting right we are interested in getting bounds right. So, the conjugate gradient method finds the polynomial p i that minimizes this above expression right. So, the polynomial p i if found using conjugate gradient satisfies the following condition. What is that condition? Norm of e i square with respect to a is lesser than or equal to min p i belonging to p. So, the conjugate gradient method finds that polynomial p i belonging to the set of all polynomials of order i if I am considering the iteration at step 2 at iteration 2 basically all the poly all possible considers all possible quadratics right quadratics all possible quadratics and finds the quadratic finds the quadratic which minimizes this expression right. It looks at all possible quadratics right at iteration 2 at iteration 2 it looks at all the possible quadratics right quadratics in this this p i right p i lambda right this quadrat and then it finds the quadratic which minimizes this expression right. So, that minimize it finds p i belonging to the space to the set of all polynomials of order i which minimizes this expression the basically which means minimizes p i belonging to p this term remains the same and this term sigma psi j 0 lambda j is nothing but norm of E 0 square right you can show that E 0 is equal to sigma psi j v j. So, norm of E 0 square is psi j v j operating on psi j. So, the this is orthonormality we use the orthonormality of the eigenvectors we get psi j 
with p, so, so we get that right. So, in words the polynomial p i satisfies the above condition when the mod of p i square has the smallest possible value for lambda is equal to lambda max right. So, we find the eigenvalue. So, I look at each polynomial in that space suppose I am at iteration 2 at iteration 2 I look at all the quadratics all possible quadratics. I evaluate each possible quadratic for each eigenvalue for all my eigenvalues. Then for each quadratic I choose the eigenvalue which maximizes that quadratic. I do that for each of those quadratics right and then among those quadratics I choose the one which gives the smallest value for its maximum eigenvalue right. Is that is that clear? So, I am choosing I, am, I have this quadratic set of all quadratics I evaluate each quadratic for each of the eigenvalues right. I, I look at I find out which eigenvalue maximizes that quadratic put that quadratic aside look at the next quadratic do the same thing right and then finally find out which of those quadratics gives the smallest value for, for the largest eigenvalue corresponding to it right. I hope that is clear. So, so, the conjugate gradient method does all that right. So, basically it finds the quadratic which satisfies this condition right. Not only the quadratic depending on the iteration the, the, the cubic, the quartic, the quintic and so on and so forth right. Thus for values of lambda, lambda less than lambda max mod of p i square must be even smaller we know because p i is minimized for the largest eigenvalue right. So, for smaller eigenvalues p i square must be even smaller. Obviously, the best possible polynomial that is the one that would uh, result in the error norm of reaching approaching 0 will happen when the polynomial becomes 0 at all the n eigenvalues of a right. Because then p, when p i square is 0 at lambda equal to lambda max right if if it is 0 at lamb at the largest eigenvalue then it has to be 0 at all the other eigenvalues right. So, that 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 is the that is the ideal situation. So, this is only possible for a polynomial with at least n roots why because I have n eigenvalues right I have n my matrix A is of size n. So, it must have n eigenvalues and if my polynomial is has to be 0 at all those eigenvalues that means it must have n roots right it must have n roots right a quadratic has two roots. So, for n roots a polynomial must be of order n right. So, since the polynomial depends on the iteration number i. So, each at each iteration I have polynomial of order i that means when will the polynomial have n roots when I reach n iterations only then it is possible for it to have n roots right at previous iterations it cannot have n roots right it cannot have it cannot make all the eigenvalues it cannot be 0 at all the eigenvalues right. So, it is possible it is possible only when it has got n roots it is further confirmation of convergence when i is equal to n right. So, it has people have done lot of studies on this I mean people are still working on the kinds of if it is after all a relatively young technique maybe not more than 30, 40 or 50 years old right compared to some of the other techniques which have been around for several hundred years. So, people are still working on that and they have found that the convergence of the conjugate gradient method is faster when the eigenvalues are of A are clustered together which is sort of intuitive right because I need to I the, my convergence will be better when the polynomial is small at all the eigenvalues as small as possible. Now, if all the eigenvalues are together it becomes easier easier for me to make the polynomial small at all the eigenvalues right because if it is small at one eigenvalue and all the eigenvalues are together since the function is continuous polynomial is continuous it is not going to be too big at at a, at a, at a, at an at a neighbor in a neighborhood of that eigenvalue right. So, if all my eigenvalues are together it becomes easier to minimize the function right to minimize the function the error function right. So, when are when, what is going to happen when all the eigenvalues are clustered together well my condition number is going to be small what is my condition number it is my largest eigenvalue divided by my smallest eigenvalue 
So, when the eigenvalues are closer together, the condition number is going to be small, right. So, again we go back to that, that old criteria, which we have encountered time and again. The convergence depends on the condition number. For, ex for example, it has been shown for a certain class of polynomials known as Chebyshev polynomials that convergence of the conjugate gradient method is strongly dependent on the condition number. So, we, in, we know that it is going to depend on the condition number. What is the exact dependence will depend on the type of polynomials we are choosing. And for a particular type of polynomials, I have shown that expression, right? That the dependence on the condition number is like this. The con it depends on the condition number like this, right? For a different class of polynomials, it will depend on the condition number, but the dependence will be of a different form, right? For the Chebyshev polynomials, it is going to depend like this. And we can see from this expression that for smaller condition numbers, for smaller condition numbers, this term is going to become smaller, this term is going to become smaller, right? And because of that, the condition number improve the condition number of the matrix A, that is we make it, we make the condition number as close to 1 as possible, we can improve the rate of convergence. Well, how can we improve the condition number? I have my matrix A which is already given, it is a, it, and the condition number of A I cannot change. My matrix A is defined by the physical problem, right? I have a physical problem and the values in that physical problem is going to is going to determine my matrix A. So, the condition number of A is given. How can I change the condition number of A? Well, I can change the condition number of A by a process which is known as preconditioning, right? Preconditioning, which involves scaling A with a symmetric positive definite matrix M that results in this. So, I had my original equation A x equal to B. I multiply both sides with M inverse right m inverse where m is a symmetric positive definite matrix. Now, if it so turns out that the condition number of my new coefficient matrix m inverse a is much smaller than the condition number of a, then we can iteratively solve this problem much faster than my original problem, right? Because I know that the rate of convergence depends on the condition number, right? So, if somehow if I scale it with, scale that with a matrix, right? And the resultant coefficient matrix, the new coefficient matrix is M inverse A, right? And if the, if the condition number of the new coefficient matrix is much smaller than the condition number of my original matrix, then automatically it is going to converge much better, right? So, that is known as preconditioning. So, almost all, con all implementations of the conjugate gradient method are have a preconditioner, right, to improve the convergence, right. We, can, we cannot be satisfied for large problems taking n iterations, right. If I have a 100,000 by 100,000 problem, I do not want to take 100,000 steps, right. So, I want to reduce the number of steps. And what is the key to reducing the number of steps? Reducing the condition number of my coefficient matrix. How am I going to do that? By scaling it, right? By scaling it. But there is a problem. Well, what is a problem? Well, if A, M, M, A, A has to be the coefficient matrix has to be symmetric and positive definite for the conjugate gradient method to work. If M inverse A is not symmetric or positive definite, then that is the end of the story. My whole thing breaks down, right? Just because M is symmetric and positive definite does not mean that M inverse A is going to be symmetric or positive definite, right? So, if, if however, if M is symmetric and positive definite, we have seen earlier several classes earlier that it is always possible to decompose a symmetric positive definite matrix into a product of a lower triangular matrix and its transpose, right? L L transpose is equal to M, right? So, Instead of solving that previous problem, in case M inverse A is not symmetric or positive, is not symmetric and positive definite, we solve an alternative problem. What is that alternative problem? That alternative problem is L inverse A L minus T x hat is equal to L L inverse B, where we have done a, we have done a transformation of variables. 
we have created new variable x hat equal to L transpose x, right. So, you can see this is identical to this, right, because L minus t x hat is then equal to L minus t L transpose x, which is x, right. So, I have A x and then I have multiplied both sides by L inverse, right. So, this problem is identical to this problem, right. This problem is identical to this problem, right. And now, this matrix L inverse A L minus transpose is bound to be symmetric and positive definite. Why? Well, it, you can see it is symmetric by construction, right. L inverse A L minus T, if I take the transpose of that, I again get L minus T A L inverse. So, this is symmetric by construction, right. This is symmetric by construction. Matrix A of course, is symmetric. So, this is symmetric by construction and it is also going to be positive definite. Why? Because I know the uh, A is positive definite and L is always going to be positive definite, right. We, we have seen that L is going in our, if we go back to your notes, you will see that L is always positive definite. So, in that case, this matrix is always going to be positive definite. So, I can always use this as a preconditioner. And why, why can I use it as a preconditioner? Well, the reason I can use it as a preconditioner is because the spectrum of L inverse A L minus T is the same as M as that of M inverse A, right. What, what do, I mean, do I mean? Well, if I have L L T is equal L L transpose equal to M and I construct a matrix L inverse A L minus T, then the eigenvalues of L inverse A L minus T are going to be identical to the eigenvalues of m inverse a. And if the condition number of n inverse a is good, that means the condition number of l inverse a l minus t is also going to be good, right, because they have the same eigenvalues, right. So, we can see this as follows, this little proof which shows that the spectrum of l inverse a l minus t is the same as the spectrum of m inverse a, right. We can show that suppose lambda is an eigenvalue of m inverse a, we can show this by a little manipulation here, right, that lambda is also an eigenvalue of L inverse a L minus t. I do not want to go into this right now, because I want to finish this. So, let us continue. So, the condition number of L inverse a L minus t is the same as m inverse a. Hence, L inverse a L minus t is as effective a preconditioner as m inverse a, right but we see that preconditioning may involve a certain extra computational expense, right, because I have got to, I have got to find that matrix M, right, I have got to, I have got to do a decomposition, right, L L transpose and then I have to invert that and to find this, but I do this only once, right, for a, for a linear problem I do this only once, right, and once I do this I can use that, that preconditioner every time, right, for all my iterations. And if I choose my, my choose my preconditioner sufficiently well, so that its 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 condition number is much smaller than the condition number of my original matrix, I will get much much faster convergence, right? Much much faster convergence, and this is enough to compensate for the additional expense of calculating the preconditioner, right? Okay. So, this, up till now we have talked about the linear conjugate gradient method. Why linear? Because we, we, we started with minimizing a quadratic form, right. And by minimizing a quadratic form, we found that eventually we have to solve the equation A x equal to B, where A is a constant matrix, right. So, it is a linear problem. A x equal to B, A remains constant throughout. Solve it, will converge in n iterations. If you do good conditioning, you can converge even faster, right. So, that is true for quadratic forms, but nothing, I mean there are lots and lots of problems where you will encounter non-quadratic, non-linear equations, right. So, in those equations, can we use the conjugate gradient method? Well, the answer is that you can use the conjugate gradient method, but lot of the beautiful things, beautiful convergence properties, things like that, that we saw for linear conjugate gradient no longer holds true, right. However, you can use the conjugate gradient method for some with some modifications for general nonlinear equations f of x, provided 
that gradient can be calculated. What do I mean by can be calculated? The gradient exists, right? At the domain of interest, I can the gradient exists everywhere. For general nonlinear functions, the CG algorithm has to be modified in order to enable it to work. So, what are the modifications that are necessary? Well, we can no longer calculate the residual by taking the product of the A matrix with, the, with, my, with my error, right? Because now there is no A matrix, right? No constant A matrix, right? So, we can no longer do that. So, to find the minimum for general nonlinear function fx, we need to find a root of the nonlinear function grad of fx equal to 0, right? I want to minimize fx. I want to find the value of x which minimizes f x. So, I have to solve the equation grad of f x is equal to 0, right. If the minimum corresponds to x, that is x is a root of grad of f x equal to 0, then at iterate i plus 1, the residual r i plus 1 can be written as r i plus 1 is equal to grad of f x minus grad of f x i plus 1, because this is the, this is the true solution, this is the true solution minus the gradient at i plus 1. So, this minus this has got to be my residual, but at the true solution this term goes to 0. So, I have minus grad of f x i plus 1, right. So, that is that is that that has to be true. However, it is no longer possible to write also a closed form expression for the residual. We, sorry, this should not be the residual, this should be the step size, right. For the step size alpha as in this, right. So, this I can no longer write because what is my a? My a, there is no constant a. So, this expression is also not going to be true. So, what we need to do is again is at each step, I have to find out alpha which minimizes the residual in that direction and I have to do that iteratively, right. I have to do a generalized line search to find to minimize the residual along a particular search direction. So, this requires choosing alpha i in the direction d i. Since for a given d i, f of x i plus alpha i d i is a general nonlinear function of alpha i, this requires a general line search procedure. Why? Because for a given d i, I my alpha is an unknown, but this is a general nonlinear function. So, it is a general nonlinear function of alpha, it is basically a polynomial in alpha i, right. So, I have to find the value of alpha i which minimizes that poly polynomial, right. So, uh, also let us recall that when the conjugate gradient method is applied to a quadratic form, we can calculate the Gram Schmidt coefficients like this, and we found that taking advantage of the Krilov structure, the Gram Schmidt coefficients become this, right. So, in the absence of a constant coefficient matrix A for the general nonlinear equation, how to choose those Gram Schmidt coefficients becomes an open question, right? Becomes an open question. So, finding an optimal value for the Gram Schmidt coefficients beta i j for the nonlinear conjugate gradient algorithm is also a subject of current research. I mean, two commonly used expression involve the Fletcher Reeves formula, which is basically identical to that used by the quad. We say that okay, even for the nonlinear conjugate gradient, we are going to calculate beta i j using that expression, right. That is given by what is known as the Fletcher Reeves formula, and as an alternative, there is something which is known as the Polak Ribeir formula, which is given by this, which is a slight modification of the expression for the li in the linear case, right. There is also something known as the Hestner-Steinfeld's formula, which I have not mentioned, but these are all variants of this beta i j, which are used for nonlinear conjugate gradient. So, I want to wrap up my discussion on nonlinear conjugate gradients in the early part of the next lecture, and then we will move on to another second part of this course, basically, because up till now we have focused on solution techniques, right. I have this system of equations either linear or nonlinear, how can I solve those equations? So, I have concerned myself with that for the first half of this course, but the second half of this course I want to show you how I get those equations, 
how I get that system of equations linear or nonlinear equations. How do I model my physical problem to get those equations? So I eventually I model my physical problem using partial differential equations, right? So, from those partial differential equations, how do I get this system of equations, this matrix equations which I have to solve to find my solution? So, we will start talking about partial differential equations and numerical techniques for this well, for modeling partial differential equations from our next class after we wind up our discussion of the conjugate gradient method. Thank you.